chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter number 1. And we'll read verse 27 to 30. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 30. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the singing, dear Lord. We thank you, God, singing that magnifies you and exalts yes. you, Lord. And certainly we need to turn our eyes upon you this morning and look unto you, Lord. You're the author and finisher of our faith. Father, we pray if there's a lost soul here in the sanctuary this morning, that you would save them before it's too late. Father, we pray for your people, Lord, you'd help us to live for you, God, in these last days. Help uh, us, God, to be what you would have us to be. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you. We praise you for all of your blessings. And God, have your perfect will now in each and every heart. We pray in Jesus' name, and amen. 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 We left, here, uh, left off here at... Uh, reading in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 30, and in Philippians 1, 28, the Bible says, and in nothing terrified by your ad adversaries, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. I'm preaching a series of messages on God can do something with nothing. We're looking at uh, verses that have the word nothing in them. Verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversary. In other words, don't be terrified by nothing, by anything, uh, which is to them an evident token of perdition. The fact that you're not terrified is it to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. We left off going over the fact that we got to realize who the real adversary is and that rejection brings more grace when we have adversaries. The opposition and rejection from adversaries can be very difficult for the Christian. If we're not careful, we can become depressed and bitter towards those who oppose us. How do we keep from becoming bitter and angry? Two important things, basically. First, realize that God gives grace when we go through difficult times. James 4, 6, that he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You would... You would not believe down through church history the grace that God's given men and women to go through some of the things that they've gone through in their lives. And it's only by the grace of God. Amen. That's why Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yeah. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. 1 Corinthians 15.10 Secondly, understand clearly the identity of your real enemy. Many times Satan is the one who is behind the evil and the adversaries that we face. Satan is the one that stirs up opposition, slander, hatred, and attacks against you and I. Yeah. Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12, Satan is the real enemy who is trying to destroy our souls. Our testimonies for Christ and our lives, our marriages, our homes, our children, our grandchildren. It's a stinking devil. Guard against bitterness toward adversaries. Bitterness robs you of compassion and power. It distracts you from what is important. Bitterness will drain you spiritually. It will be extremely difficult for you to have spiritual victory and growth as long 
as bitterness uh, takes root in your heart. Some people don't follow the Lord today because they either got bitter for some reason or they're bitter at somebody else, uh, maybe another Christian, an unsaved person, a family member, or whatever it might be. But don't do that because bitterness can poison you and others around you. Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So it can affect many people, bitterness. Sometimes marriage to a great leader comes with a special price for his wife. Such was the case for Mary Moffat Livingston, wife of Dr. David Livingston, the great missionary in Africa, perhaps the most celebrated missionary in the Western world. Mary was born in Africa as the daughter of Robert Moffat, the missionary who inspired Livingston to go to Africa. The Livingstons were married in Africa in 1845. But the years that followed were extremely difficult for Mary. Finally, she and their six children returned to England so she could recuperate as Livingston plunged deeper into the African interior. Unfortunately, even in England, Mary lived in near poverty. The hardships of raising a family alone and long separations took their toll on Mrs. Livingston. While Livingston had a great impact on British imperialism, he did so at a tremendous cost to his family. In his absences, his children grew up fatherless, and his wife Mary eventually became bitter, and she became an alcoholic. The loneliness, grief, and poverty had taken their toll on her. She ended up dying of malaria at the age of 42 when she tried to follow David back into Africa. I'm telling you, realize who your adversary is, that God will give you grace to get through what yeah. you've got to get through. Also, respect the prompting of the Holy Spirit and His rule over your life. The impact of the Holy Spirit is essential if you and I are going to boldly stand up for the Lord. Brother Frank mentioned there in Sunday school, uh, we don't know how rough it's going to get. We're losing freedoms uh, every day, every week, every month, it seems like. I mean, you get up every day, every week, you wonder what freedoms you're losing. And the government seems to be wanting to uh, tell you how to live more and more each day. Amen. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And it's going to spill over into the spiritual realm. Yep. And then telling us, you know, when you, if you go to church, what church, and how long you're at church, and what you preach, and what you can't preach. I mean, I mean we're, you say, oh, we'll never, oh, I'm telling you. Uh, it happened. The filling or control of the Holy Spirit over your life will do more for you in being faithful than anything else. This is why we're commanded to be filled with Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled. It's not a, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. But be filled with the Spirit. Every day walk with God. You're filled with the Spirit of God. You'll find courage as you yield to His leading each day. Submit to His guidance. If you let the Lord pilot your life, He'll not steer you in the wrong direction. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need to keep your focus on your finish. It's said that a certain tribe, uh, a certain guide, lived in the deserts of Arabia, a certain guide lived in the deserts of Arabia who never lost his way. He carried with him a homing pigeon. Is that how you pronounce it? Homing, homing, H-O-M-I-N-G, homing pigeon with a very fine cord attached to one of its legs. When he was in doubt as to which path he should take, he threw the bird into the air. The pigeon quickly strained at the cord to fly in the direction of home and thus led the guide accurately to his goal. Because of this unique practice, he was known as the Dove Man. The Dove Man. In the same manner, the Holy Spirit, the, the Heavenly Dove, amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. The Heavenly Dove is willing and able to direct us in the narrow way that leads to the more abundant life if we will submit and follow his lead. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to do something that contradicts His Word. Contradicts His Word. The person that walks with God grows in faith and confidence 
and calmness of God's care, even when it's time to die, when it's time to leave this old world, uh, that relationship takes the terror out of death. It also weakens the intimidation of adversaries because the Christian knows wherever he goes and whatever happens to him, God is at his side. The Lord is always with him, whether it's in life or death. Because of that promise, we are encouraged and strengthened to stand up for Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen. And then have regular times of prayer with the Lord. We're talking about Philippians 1.28, and nothing terrified by your adversaries. You don't have to be terrified by your adversaries. I don't worry five seconds about it. You say the country's going to hell in a handbasket. I know it is. But I'm telling you what, I'm still going to preach and teach the word of God. Amen. I'm going to preach and teach the word of God. I want to do it in the right spirit. And I want to be faithful to God. And whatever happens, let her rip. Amen. Amen. As Brother Claude Spurlock says, let her rip, tater chip. Have you ever heard him say that? <laughs> yeah. I don't know where he got that from, but... Alexander Witt said, Our office is the royal priesthood. We are to be people of prayer. The scientist Sir Isaac Newton said, I can take my telescope and look millions of miles into space, watch the blazing suns and rolling planets in the infinite depth of immensity, but I can lay it aside and go into my room, shut the door, and get down on my knees in earnest prayer and see more of heaven and get closer to God than when assisted by all the telescopes and material agencies of earth. Learn to pray. Keith Noss said, men never learn to pray in public, they learn in private. If we are never in Gethsemane when alone, we shall not find our way there in the crowd. If we're to speak boldly and courageously for Christ, then it's important to maintain a regular prayer life. Yeah. We should pray for his leading and direction for our lives. Yeah. Psalms 5, 8, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Psalms 27, 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. David had enemies. Anybody in the Bible that served God and lived for God, anybody down through the centuries since Adam and Eve, that loved God and served God and obeyed God had enemies and you're going to have enemies if you love the Lord and serve Him and stand for the Lord. Amen. You're going to have enemies. Prevailing prayer gives courage and boldness to the Christian. It develops a close relationship with the Savior. Daniel prayed, even though he was threatened with death. Richard Foster said, Real prayer comes not from gritting our teeth, but from falling in love. Are you in love with the Savior? When we are in desperate and danger down in the dumps or depressed, we can cry out to the Lord. He'll hear our cry. Do not, do not underestimate the power of your prayers. Amen. The devil and your flesh will tell you that it isn't worth it and nothing's happening. God isn't doing nothing. And it don't matter if you pray anyways, blah, blah, blah. T. DeWitt Talmadge, a great preacher in the 1800s, said, Show me a man who prays and his strength and power cannot be exaggerated. Give to a man this power of prayer and you give him almost omnipotence. Yeah. George Mueller was an outstanding Christian and a man of prayer. George Mueller ran the orphanages and didn't have money a lot of times. He'd spend three or four hours a day in prayer and a bunch of food would show up on the doorstep and money and everything else. He wouldn't tell anybody about it. He'd just go to God about the needs of the orphanages for the children back, back years and years ago, and he was a prayer warrior, and miraculously, food showed up from uh, different sources and different people and everything else. It was God who provided that. Yeah, amen. 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 He said, George Mueller said, I live in the spirit of prayer. I pray as I walk about, when I lie down, when I rise up, and the answers are always coming. Charles G. Finney was a powerful preacher and a man of prayer. He said, unless I had the spirit of prayer, I could do nothing. But prayer is not just for preachers. It's for all Christians. Dr. Ralph Byron was an outstanding Christian surgeon, a doctor. Early in his medical profession, he sought for a way to make his life count for God. Professionally and personally, he wanted to be a man of God. One day in his search for godliness, he came across Ezekiel 22.30. And I searched for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Uh... But I found no one, found none. 
Dr. Byron pondered this kind of question. He said, would God find me standing in the gap? Here he was, a young surgeon with a press of responsibility all around him, and he answered the question honestly, no, not right now, he said to himself. He concluded that in order for him to be a man of God, he must continually place a priority on prayer. At first it was very difficult because his duties were numerous, you can imagine. He decided that in order for him to have, to have time with God, he would personally have to get up very early. He set aside the time of 5.30 a.m., which he called an unearthly hour, but he did it week after week. It was the best time in light of his busy schedule. The remarkable thing he discovered was that within just two weeks, he began to have a quality of life that he had never known before. He saw two men trust Christ as Savior. He discovered that a major conflict in their church had been resolved, dissolved is a better word, as he committed it faithfully to God in prayer. So he concluded, it was apparent to me that I must give prayer top priority, even if it means getting less than six hours of sleep every night. What a great example and challenge he was to all believers. He went home to be with the Lord in January of 2005. His obituary said, quote, a man after God's own heart. He served the Lord in every aspect of his life, relationships, the military, medical, church, and evangelistic ministries. His impact has reached far and wide. He will be greatly missed by all, unquote. What a great legacy for Christ he left in his wake. S.D. Gordon said, The great people of earth are the people who pray. Keith Noss said, Eternity will reveal that the greatest benefactors of the world are men and women of prayer. God will answer earnest prayer. Let, it, let him therefore who drives the chariot of the Lord not be frightened by the fire of the Holy Spirit you will find that you will get more done when you spend time in prayer. You yep. say, well, how can I? I don't know. I'm just telling you. Things go better. I, God has a way of working things out. Yeah. When you spend time in prayer, I don't know what it is, you have more time. I, I know that sounds crazy. From a human standpoint, that sounds like you're crazy. But when you have, people that pray get more done. People who have a prayer life, they see God do more. God does things, and they don't have to go 18 hours a day. They do it 12 hours a day, but they pray. And so God handles a lot of things for them. Yeah. I'm not saying that we can be lazy and not handle things. I'm just saying that there's something about it. I, I've watched it for years since I've been saved. I've watched that the men and women who pray, spend time in prayer, and really lean on God. I don't know what it is, but they have seem to have more time. They seem to have they seem to see more things done in their life, and they they seem to see more. They seem to get more prayers answered. See God do more do more in their life or family or what? I don't know what it is. It's it kind of it goes against human reasoning. And then regard the reputation of Christ and His approval as an important priority. If you desire to speak boldly for Christ and stand for him, then you'll need to come to a point in your life where his approval is more important and valuable than the approval of this world. A lot of Christians can't get past that point because they just want everybody to love them. Well, I think everybody wants people to like them. I think that's a human thing. But you've got to get a divorce, as Dr. Green said for years ago. You've got to get a divorce from public opinion. Yeah. See? His reputation must be more important. His reputation must be more important than yours. This will help you to conquer intimidation. When his reputation is more important to you, it will not be difficult to live for Christ and stand up for him. If your passion is to be popular or accepted by a worldly group of people, you'll have difficulty standing for Jesus Christ. The craving for acceptance indicates its importance to you. The priority you place on popularity or the acceptance of the crowd reveals the influence of your peers on your life. Hey, when I got saved, 
People say, when you get saved, you got to leave your old friends and the old things you did. I didn't have to leave my friend. I didn't have, I didn't have to leave them. They left me. I got saved. I got born again. They seen that I was serious about serving God. They didn't want it. They didn't want nothing to do with me. If you're going to learn to stand for Christ, then the opinion of God must be more important to you than the opinion of men. If you want to keep your joy and sanity, don't go through life thirsting for or seeking the approval of men at any, of men at any cost. Why? Because the approval of man is shallow and does not satisfy. It's shaky and short-lived. In other words, it doesn't last long in time. It's selfish, and selfish people are seldom happy. It'll shackle you from serving God, especially when serving the Lord doesn't meet men's approval. We'll see this in the book of Ecclesiastes starting tonight. God put something in you. You ever notice greedy and selfish people, self-centered, greedy, selfish people are not generally happy people? God put something within you to serve others, to help others in some way. You know, a lot of people, when they retire, they start doing volunteer work. And I've talked to a lot of people through the years, and they, they, they do volunteer work. I said, why do you do volunteer work? I just like helping other people. There's something about it. And Solomon talks about that in Ecclesiastes. I mean, I won't go real deep into that stuff in Ecclesiastes, but it, it's selfish. Selfish people are seldom happy. Uh, it'll shackle you from serving God, especially when serving the Lord doesn't meet men's approval. Pleasing the Lord needs to take precedence over pleasing people. That's why a lot of Christians don't get outside the camp and bear God's reproach. They're scared to death of what people will think or say. When God when the God was dealing with me about getting saved, the devil said, what will people think? He's going to tell them you got saved. He really jumped on me when the Lord dealt with me a few months after I got saved about preaching. And the devil says, what will people think? What will your family think? You're called to preach. What do you mean you're called? I'm called to preach. I'm wow, what we do. That's what the devil said to them. The devil will fight you tooth and nail. He fights you when it comes to spiritual things. He don't fight you if you want to go on a picnic. I'm not preaching against picnics. I'm just saying. There's nothing spiritual about it, so he don't fight you about that. He don't fight you about going fishing or hunting. He fights you when you get ready to get serious about God. Yeah. And serve God. And there's nothing wrong with those things. Fishing, hunting, that sort of thing. I'm just saying. It's a spiritual thing. He don't want you to get real serious about the Lord and the things of God. Amen. A man was driving down a bumpy country road when he saw a bag of cement beside the road. It appeared to have fallen off of a delivery truck and hit one of the bumps in the rough road. Being a person who does not like to see anything wasted, he stopped to pick up the lost bag of cement. When he reached down to pick up this heavy bag, to his surprise, he discovered it was not soft and limber as he had expected, but had solidified into an immovable piece of cement. Often our lives are like that bag of cement. They take on shapes that were not intended for us and become hardened in that shape. That bag of cement was meant to become a part of some beautiful structure. But because it did not reach its place of service, because it was not used in the purpose for which it was made, it became a useless rock in the form of a bag of semen. The opportunity to make something wonderful or useful was gone once it became hard God wants to make something beautiful with your life. Don't let it divide the heart or missed opportunities for all of you. Make sure the Lord is number one in your life and approval, his approval. 